Well, we're here again on this beautiful day in the month of Aviv with Eric, and this is a welcome to the love story. Let's zero in on that picture you got there, Eric, so people can have a look at that. Everybody see that okay? Hope. There's a fish, a goldfish, jumping out of a bowl of water that says noon, and another bottle, bowl of water that says mem. Looks like the fish is diving from the noon into the mem, but the alphabetic sequence is that they say noon is a fish that jumps out of the water, so mem is the water and noon is the fish jumping out of the water. So somebody put this together in terms of uh, a fish jumping from one bowl into another, Kurt Stoller, that we're doing the uh, other talks on the Erectology YouTube, put the mem in the noon. And it's like, well, what's that a statement of? Again, it's all the study of the words. So, noon mem, nam, if it's noon aleph mem, that's thus saith, or the word of Yahuwah being declared as the signet ring, Memnoon is where you get the word manna, which means to count, to number, or set the pace. An interesting thing about the words that the words that are spelled, various words that are spelled with mem and noon, especially when they're in the alphabetic letter sequence order, chronological order. Like shemen, shin memnoon is the word for oil. And it also means to praise to appraise, assess, to give account, to determine something's value and worth, which is exactly a synonym with Eric, Ayn Resh Kof, and also another synonym with Sheen Ayn Resh, which is to determine what something is worth. It's also the word that means gateway or entrance, a goal like goal posts on a football field or a basketball hoop on a basketball court. Something that you aim at. It's also the word for goat and horrible and stormy. And part of this study is not just knowing what the letters mean or knowing how to read the dictionary so you can see what words mean, but trying to determine or assess or evaluate what's he really talking about. So you have the definition of the word at one level You've got the spelling of the word, what letters are used at another level. Then at another regard, you've got, hey, look it, there's the letters that are in the alphabetic letter sequence. And then another way of regarding is some of the letters line up with the days of creation or the Beatitudes or the Moedim. And then all the letters, one way or another, fit into the story of Yeshua, his coming here in disguise being put to death, crucified, thrown into a tomb, three days, three nights later, resurrecting, rising up, coming back. I mean, there's the alphabet. There's the 22 letters of the alphabet. And so part of this study is plugging in those values as if the letters of the alphabet were variables in an algebraic mathematic equation. And then the question is, well, how do you prove what value those letters have? Well, because of all these encoded systems that I just mentioned. The Mishkan itself. So, Mem and Nun happen to be the two letters that line up with the bronze laver, which lines up with the festival called Shavuot, which is the Feast of Weeks. Shavua is Shin Bet Ayan, or Shin Bet Vav Ayan is the number seven, like a week of seven days. And Shavua Ot, Vav Tav is plural, so it's the counting of weeks. The counting of seven sevens and then counting the 50, 50th day, 50, so Pentecost, 50. Or some people add another 50, as we've talked before. But the whole idea that mem is water and noon is something that jumps out, like a fish jumping out of water, I'll explain the pertinence of this. What we're going to talk about here yeah, in Mark, particular uh, is the Shema. What yeah. were you saying? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, in, in uh, I think it was Mark 12, he was asked, the Messiah was asked, what, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, Shema, he was quoting Deuteronomy. There's so much there that people could just gloss over and think, you know, well, okay, here all Israel, our Elohim is one. Take it off. Well, so here, so Yeshua, 
when, when asked, as Stu was just saying, what's the greatest commandment? It's, he's quoting from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. And this is what it says in the Stone Snot translation. Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God. Hashem is the one and only. Doesn't sound like a commandment to me. Doesn't, no. Picture back in the olden days, you know, a guy with a ring and a bell, hear ye, hear ye, ding dong, you know, and making some kind of proclamation. Well, for him to say hear ye was, hey, hey, you. That's not a command. It's gathering somebody's attention or maybe gathering some people around to pay heed, give attention, but that, that's not the command. At least it doesn't seem like it. I've heard it said, it'd be interesting to know what the Message Bible said. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> anyway, one of them said, listen up, Israel. Oh, listen up. As if that was the command. But here, in Hebrew, what it says is, Shema Israel, Yahuwah Eloheinu, Yahuwah Echad. Six words. So we're going to look at the six words. But we're going to talk about a little bit beyond that. One of the things, let me just proceed. That's technically the Shema. But there's a few other verses. Isn't that the most sacred text? In Judaism? The Shema? Yeah. From what I heard, just like you hear, I don't know what they do, but you hear the Muslims are supposed to, what, pray three times a day, pray five times a day, they roll out the mat and bow down, and they, well, okay, so the Jews are supposed to have these words on their lips as they rise up, as they go to sleep, maybe a few times during the day, and, on, and certainly on your dying breath. Proclaim the Shema. Hashem our God, Hashem is the one and only. I've heard it quoted in English, the Lord is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. <laughs> What's that mean? That's a statement of we are monotheistic. We believe in one, only it's three, but it's really one, but it's really three, but it's really one, but it's... What does it mean? What is he saying? The following words... Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Eloheka. Ve'kol lavevka uve'kol nafshaka uve'kol meodeka. Translated. And you will love. Aleph Tav. It's one of those standalone Aleph Tavs. Then it says Yahuwah Eloheka. And as we said in the last video, the word Eloheka is Eloai, Elohi. Like the word Eloy in English, there's a rock band by the name of Eloy. You remember those guys back yeah, in the yeah. 60s, 70s? They were a little bit obscure. Getting dated. <laughs> <laughs> that came from the Time Machine book. Oh, it did? What is it, H.G. Wells? The Eloy were the guys, the rulers that were living on the top. They were dressed in like silk and linen, and they were eating all these wonderful things and living in a garden. And the Morlocks were living underneath the ground, running the machinery. And the, the Eloi would disappear every once in a while, and nobody knew why. But the upshot of the book was the Morlocks were farming, raising the Eloi like fattened sheep that they would eat once in a while. They'd just go up in the middle of the night while they were asleep and grab one and take it down and barbecue them <laughs> under the earth. But the word Eloi is where we get the word Elohim. It's Hebrew. And so even in that book by H.G. Wells, speaking of the future, that the, uh, the fat cats or the fattened sheep of the Eloi, of the Elohim, are actually thinking that they're ruling the Morlocks. It's actually the inverse. It's just one of those, uh, you know, books on perspective. Anyway, the, uh, you will love Aleph Tav Yahweh Eloheka, Vekol Avivka, means with all your heart, Uvekol Nafshaka, with all your soul, Uve kol, this is an interesting word, mem, aleph, dalet, kaf, so the kaf suffix means your, and so it's where the English letters would be M-A-D, and it's translated with all your strength, but it's in the English where we get the word mad or madly, like, didn't the Beatles do a song, love, love her madly, 
Wasn't that theirs? Well, Madly comes right out of this Hebrew word. No, it's yes. the doors. Well, that was the doors. Yeah. Gotta love her Madly. There you go. Right. Getting dated again. <laughs> and with all your heart and all your soul, we were just talking about that in Deuteronomy 30. So, we were going to play this on the last video, and it didn't happen, so I'm whistling the tune to you here. When you're a little kid learning the piano, that's one of the very first songs you learn how to play. And it's called Heart and Soul. And I'm sure there's lyrics, I don't know what they're about, but it comes right out of Deuteronomy 30, and the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. You shall love. And it's like, oh, come on, what does that even mean? How do you love the invisible essence? He'll probably tell us. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your madly? Is it left up to your own whim of discretion? I wouldn't think so. He goes on to say, verse 6, and then why I'm quoting this is, this is all part of the elaboration of the first verse, which we're going to get into in just a moment, but just to give the overall. And these matters that I command you today shall be upon your heart. Okay, what does that mean? You're supposed to carry them as a burden. Well, that would be the word ayin nun hey, which is otherwise translated fast, as in the day of Yom Kippur, Humble yourself, be afflicted by these matters, respond, carry them as your burden, as your concern, as your occupation, as I, I'm, I'm like really attentive to these things. That's, that's the equivalent word, to be upon your heart. The word heart is where in English we get the word love. In Hebrew the word heart is lamed bet, the bet is pronounced as either a B or a V, so the word love, lamed bet, or lavav, lamed bet bet, is also the word to inflame, where we get the word lava, L-A-V-A, like what comes out of a volcano, this burning hot. So the idea of using these English words to look at the Hebrew is that it explains it. The whole idea of the etymological dictionary is not to say Hebrew came out of Akkadian, Syrian, Ugaritic, these various other languages, but by looking at the other languages and seeing where their words that are phonetically or that spelled exactly the same, where we get those meanings, now I can make this association. That's, I'm, I mentioned this because somebody asked me this a little while ago, saying, hey, how can you look at all these other languages? Does it mean Hebrew was a derivative of them, or Hebrew came out of these other ancient Middle Eastern languages? No, I believe it's the opposite. I believe Hebrew was the first, what Isaac Moseson calls the Edenic, language, like Garden of Eden, Edenic. Isaac Moseson put a plug in for him and his books, just an astounding scholar, brilliant mind, wrote a book, The Origin of Speeches, another book called The Word, I highly recommend. It'll give this insight into the way the language works. So by looking at the other languages etymologically, which is to say similar spelling, similar phonetics, similar meanings, synonyms, where you can so, oh, because these guys call it that, like because we call what comes out of a volcano lava, and it's moving, and it's hot, and it's almost alive, well, that's the way we're supposed to love Yahuwah in our heart. Because it sounds like lava, even though it's spelled differently, it basically means the same thing. Anyway, verse 7, you shall teach them thoroughly to your children. These matters I command you this day. Deuteronomy 6 had nothing to do with the Psalms and the Proverbs and the books of the Prophets and the New Testament and the book of Revelation. It's these words, Deuteronomy 6. In Deuteronomy 4, he was talking about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are found listed in Exodus 20 and then also Deuteronomy 4. So, it says in Deuteronomy 5, not with our forefathers, did Yahweh seal this covenant, but with us, we who are here, all of us alive today, 
Well, he did seal the covenant with our forefathers. What's he saying? So you have to know how to read the words, know what the words mean, which is an interpretation. So there's, what did he say? What's it mean? What's the translation? What's the interpretation? And so people say there's, there's the, the, that the rabbis say there's four levels of how to read scripture. And they liken it to the word pardes, which in English would be paradise, the consonant phonetics of P-R-D-S, which in Hebrew is Peshat, the P, Ramez, the R, Drash, the D, and the Sod, the Samic, the S sound. So you got, well, that's the surface narrative. What do the words say? What does it mean? What are the hints or the allegories, the metaphors? That's the Ramez. Then what Drash is study. You'll search out, make these comparisons. But then the Sod is what they call, what Brad Scott called family secrets, deep things that only the esoterically attuned will know what it's about. And I would have to kick in another level. Maybe it's, I heard somebody once say that some of these things we talk about is the sowed of the sowed. The deep, the, the word sowed is deep, dark foundation secret. It literally, it's the word for foundation under a house. It's what holds up the house, but you can't see it. It's buried under the earth, encased in concrete and other things built on top of it. And that the foundation of the language is the Mishkan pattern, coded to the seven days of creation, the seven Moedim, the seven Beatitudes, there's actually eight or nine, depending on how you count them and orchestrate them, of Matthew 5. But, but the ultimate sowed is that Yeshua being the Mashiach of Israel is mapping and fixing in position every one of these 22 letters. And when he claimed to be the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, in Greek, Alpha, Omega, in English, A and Z, he was saying this is all about him. So these are all different ways to take the letter values and plug them into each word, which we're going to do with the word Shema in just a moment. So when he says, you will teach them thoroughly to your children, and you shall speak of them while you sit in your home, while you walk on the way, when you retire, and when you arise. Why, that's being obsessive compulsive about this stuff. And I've made mention to some people, I'm intentionally obsessive. It's not that, what is the matter with me? I've got some psychological quirk, then like, what's your hang up? Oh, he's just got this thing, this interest, and it's like, oh, well, you know, it's just like a, a hobby. It's like, he said to obsess. So I've determined to obsess on purpose. Some people, man, I've met some people that know sports statistics like crazy. They could tell you batters and what their, how many runs they had, what season, who played in what Super Bowl game, and okay, I don't care about that. Somebody else might find it interesting. That's a hobby. That's that's an obsession. But he says, speak of them. And I've, I've mentioned before, this has something to do with the shape of the letter bet. The letter bet is, is a curl which opens up, similar to the letter phi, similar to the concept of the gold mean spiral, where you've got this, this single cell zygote of a fertilized egg becoming an embryo and uh, turning into this fetus. And so you've got, boom, this one cell that turns into two, then four, then eight, multiplying mitosis and then opening up that the, the single cell becomes basically the brain forming the eye, then extending out like the, the, the you might say, the tail of the, of the tadpole shape, the head with the tail that forms the backbone out which comes, you know, branching into the environment with the, the arms and legs. These pictures are embedded in the alphabet letters, and so by looking at the orthography, the shape of the letters, especially the paleo letters, you can read into it other ways to read what the letters mean. So when you sit in your home, well, here, back up. These matters shall be on your heart. That's the interior of you personally. And you will then teach to your children. That's to extend out to the world around you. Speak of them. That's your mouth while you sit in your home and then when you walk on the way. So that's inner and then that's the world around you. So your children around you is one orbit, you might say, around the planet. As you walk on the way is another bigger orbit. So picture the typical picture of, a, of an atom. You've got the nucleus and then you've got the electrons floating around in these different orbits around it. It's the same picture, so it's this fractal pattern of how the universe is even built. When you retire, 
that's when you're going to sleep and again when you go to sleep your whole body kind of goes dormant you turn off the lights you crawl into bed and you and so that's down in your own soul your own being and when you arise which is the inverse the poker will open back up so that's a, that's why I draw the letter bet the way I draw it because it incorporates these concepts into it verse 8 bind them as a sign upon your arm and let them be ornaments between your eyes so it's not like a horse wearing these blinders it's something between your eyes it's like the the dot that the that the in people from India wear whatever that means that's their culture but it's the kind of a thing where it's always right there that's your third eye people that are into the pineal gland and all um, Verse 9, and write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. So not only is it your own hands, your own eyes, your mind, your, your, how, you see, how you see the invisible world. How you see with your third eye. Those are invoking concepts that are not Christian, and not even maybe should be delved into, or maybe they ought to be. Nevertheless, something about this being the guide, like blinders, like a focus of... He's telling us... There's something in these words. I don't know if you can see it. Right there is the Ten Commandments written on the doorposts of this house. Made, made out of brick and not wood, but there you go. And also over there. Right there. And they're on that doorpost there. There's, it's not written in English, but it's written in uh, plasma. Yeah. <laughs> now that we're off lockdown. Yeah, different matter. And I'm just going along a little bit more in Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. It'll be when Yahuwah your Elohim, that's Yahuwah Eloheka, brings you to the land. So if we're not in the land, then certain things don't apply. And if you are in the land, other things apply. That's another conversation. That Yahuwah swore to your father. So he said he's going to do something. He has to do it. That's Aleph and Tav. For him to swear, that's Aleph. And for him to accomplish that which he swore is the Tav. So if you know that about the letters, I can read into it. Oh, here's an... Here's an embedded, uh, an esoteric Aleph Tav, though you won't find the word spelled Aleph Tav in the surface narrative of the text. But I can see it in what he's saying, if you know what the letters mean. He swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Yitzhak, to Yaakov, to give you great and good cities that you did not build, houses filled with every good thing that you did not fill, chiseled cisterns that you did not chisel. That's a heck of a lot of work. So Yahweh is going to take the labor of the heathens, the labor of the infidels, and hand it as a gift to his people. That's one reason why Yahweh doesn't just take out the bad guys and make us work like crazy, because he says, no, I'm going to have all the, the evil people, the infidels, the heathens, the unbelievers, I'm going to have them work their lives away and hand it to you seems my whole life I've been one of the workers. I've, you know, it's like, what the, how does this work? Orchards and olive trees that you did not plant, and you shall eat and be satisfied. That word satisfied is sheen bet ayan, the number seven. Beware, now that word beware is shamar, sheen mem resh. We'll talk about that in a moment. Beware, that's a caution, like flashing lights. Beware for yourselves, lest you forget Yahweh. Who? You won't find his name in the King James Bible. You might find the Jehovah, I think, what, twice in some of the Psalms? It's not really even supposed to be Jehovah. Think, There's no letter J. I think Yah is mentioned in the King James, isn't it? Yah might be mentioned, but they took out his it's name how many say, times? Yeah. Close to 3,000 times? Or 6,000? 6,000 times. They, they 6, the, the writers of the Septuagint under Ptolemy II back in approximately 285 B.C., by saying 285 B.C., then by... 1985, or excuse me, 2015, it was basically 2,300 years. So the idea of this 2,300 year obfuscation, just total obliteration of Yahoo's name, and my whole life nobody ever talked about his name. I know the JWs, the Jehovah's Witnesses, talked about his name, only it was never a J. It was yud he vav -Heh. but at least they show pictures of where his name can be found. There's another guy on Facebook that's always talking about that. Remember? 
German name. Sorry, I forget I your remember. name. But anyway, where, the name, where can it be found? And uh, he has pictures all over showing different architectures with the yod heh vav -Heh written in some sort of emblem on the wall. People have regarded his name but not remembered how to say it or why should we say it? What I'm saying is, verse 12, Deuteronomy 6, Beware for yourselves lest you forget Yahuwah who took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. Yahweh Eleheka shall you fear, him shall you serve, and in his name you will swear. So if his name was obliterated and lost and nobody's allowed to say it or can say it or remembers how to say it, though it probably sounds like saying the word Hawaii backwards, Iyawa, which is like I-O-W-A, the name of the state in the heartland of the United States, other than that, nobody knows how to say his name. But here he says, swear in his name. Don't swear by the altar or the gold on the altar or the, the you know the the sacrifice on the altar as Yeshua said, swear in the name of Yahuwah, our Elohim. But we don't. Verse 14, you shall not follow after the Elohim Achrim, gods of others or other gods, of the gods of the peoples that are around you. Even when you do them in celebration, like Christmas, Easter, and Sunday and Halloween. For a jealous, that's Alcona, like the coffee in Hawaii, Alcona is Yahuwah Eloheka among you, lest the wrath of Yahweh Eloheka will flare against you and he destroy you from upon the face of the earth. The reason I'm reading this is all powered of Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, though we'll get back to the exact six words of the Shema in just a moment. Verse 16, you shall not test Yahweh your Eloheka as you tested him at Massa, where they were bitter because of the water, you shall surely observe the commandments of Yahweh your Elohim. Well, that's only written until the Jews were crucified Yeshua, and once he died on the cross, nobody has to do what he says anymore, right? Oh, of course. That's the only thing that makes sense, Eric. And his testimonies and his decrees that he commanded you, well, that was until the New Testament, so this was only good until Malachi. Yeah, we're just going through some history here. You sh I'm being facetious, don't believe what I just said, <laughs> just for the record. I think people know we're joking by now. You shall, I'll say it again, you shall surely observe the commandments of Yahweh Eloheka and his testimonies and his decrees that he commanded you. You shall do what is fair and good in the eyes of Yahuwah so that, okay, here's the balance scales of justice. This is Mishvat. You do good so that you put this on your side of the scales of balance and what comes back to you is this you do good in the eyes of Yahweh so that it will be good for you so when Yeshua said do unto others as you would have others do unto you yeah yeah no, that's the other that's the golden rule and it's like why because that's mishpat that's the scales of balance that's exactly the foundation of Yahuwah's throne so that's not a New Testament proverb that is from the foundation of the universe the way this place is built a man's way is returned on his own head. Period. That's the way it works. It, even for nations. So that, and you shall come and possess the good land that Yahuwah swore to your forefathers to thrust away your enemies from before you as Yahuwah spoke. If your child asks you tomorrow, saying, what are the testimonies and the decrees and the ordinances that Yahuwah spoke and commanded you, you will say to your child. Now, last night we observed Passover on the full lunar calendar. So this is the first day of Chag Hamatzot, unleavened bread. Other people are going to observe it in two weeks, if not four weeks from now, but nevertheless, just so you know, here it is having nothing to do with the Passover. Here's Moshe in Deuteronomy 6, and, and when he says, when the children are not, see, it, when you give, when you do the Passover, and their children said, why are we eating this bread? You tell them the Exodus story. But here, when they say, what are, here's a list of legal observations. They're called, in this case, testimonies, decrees, and ordinances. The words in Hebrew are, ayin dalet tov, chet kuf, and mem zadi vav tov. That's another conversation about those. We've talked about those before, maybe we'll get to it if we run out of time. But what I'm saying is, this is what he said. Tell them the story of the Exodus. You shall say to your child, verse 21 of Deuteronomy 6, We were slaves to Pharaoh, or Paharo, in Egypt, and Yahuwah took us out of Egypt with a strong hand. Yahweh placed signs 
and wonders. That word for signs is also the same as the word for letter of the alphabet. It's, it's an aleph of top. Signs and wonder, the word for wonder is pele, so paleo out letters of the alphabet were the first two things, depending on how you read this. Great and harmful against Egypt, against Paro, and against his entire household before our eyes. And he took us out of there in order to bring us, to give us to the land, give us the land that he swore to our forefathers. Yahuwah commanded us to perform all these decrees. That's another word in English of description. That's the word here translated, I believe, mishvat. To fear Yahuwah our Elohim for our good. See, this isn't God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life, one of the four spiritual laws. This is because Yahuwah has designed the universe a certain way, and because Yahuwah swore to our forefathers, it's conditional on our behavior. We need to do certain things in order to then gain or receive everything that Yahweh said. Yahuwah commanded us to perform all these decrees, to fear Yahweh our Elohim, for our good all the days, all the days, that includes now, to give us life as this very day. And it will be a merit for us. Well, here the word is actually zadikah. It will be righteousness for us. The word zadikah is not just merit, it's also victory, deliverance, and salvation, and justice, and righteousness. So if you just say, it'll be a right merit for us, it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I was in Boy Scouts, you get a merit badge. Okay. You get a merit or a demerit if your shoes are shined or your bed is made. It's like, oh, okay, whatever. But when he says, hey, your job is to be righteous. Ah, I can quote the verse that says, there are none righteous. No, not one. <laughs> he said, it will be merited as righteousness for us if we are careful to perform this entire commandment before or in the face of, in the eyes of, Yahuwah, our Elohim, as he commanded us. So if he says there's none righteous, no, not one, that's to say only Yeshua is righteous, purely righteous, and every one of us are filthy... What, what's that term in the, the, the song? A wretch? We're filthy wretches of despicable Mystical degradation? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Nothing. The point is, he says, if we are careful to perform, to do, that's the word ayin shin hey, But back to, the, back to what you said about no, not one, none righteous, that was a present condition, but not a former condition. If you go back and look at the context there. See, what? so what you're saying is that the, the, the quote that is millions of times quoted in the church is taken out of context oh, and leads God. us to believe completely the wrong Just foundation of who we are and what we're supposed to do. Go back and read the context of where it originally came from in the Tanakh, and you'll see that that was a present condition, but not a former. They were walking in righteousness, and they'd fallen. I'm going to back up a little bit into Deuteronomy 5. Remember, Deuteronomy 4 is the, giving, is the reiteration. This... Okay, just so people know, Moshe, it, the, the <coughs> exodus is when they came out of Egypt, and then because they didn't believe Yahweh for 40 years, they had to wander in the wilderness, that's a different part of the story. But this is now, after the 40 years, Moshe is talking to the people, Moshe is just about to die, he's going over the history narrative and the, the concerns and the matters for the people of Israel, the collective 12 tribes to regard, just before he dies. So Deuteronomy 4, he's telling again about the Ten Commandments, and then he says this in Deuteronomy 5, verse 21. Go back to verse 21. Moshe is saying to the people, You said, Behold, Yahweh our Elohim, that's Yahuwah Eloheinu, the new means our, third person, uh, first person possessive. Anyway, Behold, Yahuwah Eloheinu has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. This day we saw, we hear and we see, that Yahweh will speak to a person and he can live. Listen to Yahweh's voice and you will live. But now, why should we die when this great fire consumes us? If we continue to hear the voice of Yahweh or Elohim any longer, we will die. Is this insane? The people say, we have just been participants in a miracle. 
to see, to hear the voice of Elohim and live. Wow, that's, that's, that's wonderful. But if we hear any more, we're going to die. The other video did about Samson's father saying the same thing, and his mother said, do you, think he, he, do you think he showed us this to kill us? Do you think he brought us here and let us hear these wonderful things because he was going to kill us? No, he didn't. He, he showed us these things and let us hear these things so that we could incorporate them into our consciousness, into our heart, and live better. Didn't Johnny Carson have something called, or David Letterman, sim, uh, stupid human tricks? No. <laughs> this, is, this is stupid human thinking. Stupid human tricks is that we think like this. Uh, so that we don't. That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> is there any human that has heard the voice of the living Elohim speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Yeah, your whole people did. You should approach and hear this. Now the people saying to Moshe, you should approach and hear whatever Yahweh our Elohim will say, and you should tell us. You speak to us, whatever Yahweh our Elohim said, and will speak to you, then we shall hear and we shall do. This has set up the church system right here. This set up the whole notion of a priest class that will go be as intermediaries to receive from Elohim, take the words and dispense the graces, dispense the meaning of words to the people. The people will bring their concerns to the priest and give them back to Yahuwah because of this attitude. It, that was way back 1500 BC, and we're, we're still in the midst of that, and I'm not saying that's right. But I'm saying this is what he's talking about. Then verse 25 of Deuteronomy 5. Yahweh heard the sound of your words when you spoke to me, and Yahweh said, I have heard the sounds of the words of these people that they have spoken to you. And they did well in all that they spoke? Well, they did well by saying, whatever you tell us he said, we'll do. And remember, Yeshua said, whatever the rabbis, the teachers, tell you that Moshe said, do that, but don't follow their behavior. So you have to be able to scrutinize what he's saying here. Verse 26, Who can assure th that this heart should remain in theirs to fear me and observe all my commandments all the days so that it would be good for them and for their children forever? So Yahweh or Elohim is saying, if you hear my voice and do it, I will hear your voice and I will do what I said. I'm trying to build this up that it's contingent. Yahweh giving us as he said, as he promised, is contingent, is on the other side of the scales of balance of us listening to his voice and doing what he said. To listen to his voice is the word Shema. The word to guard and keep is the word Shamar. The word to actually then not just hear, but to guard it and then do it is Asha, or Ose, Ayin Shin He. So what I'm saying is that when he says, Shema Israel, it's not, Hear ye, hear ye, listen up, boys. It's, <laughs> Grab with your ear, hold it tightly in your heart, and use it as a great cup of Java, you know, coffee to impel you to, whoom, put it into action. Hallelujah. That's the word Shema. Verse 27, go to them and say, return to your tents, but as for you, stand here with me so that I shall speak to you the entire commandment and the decrees and the ordinances that you shall teach them and they shall perform them in the land that I gave them to possess it. Verse 29, you shall be careful to act. Be careful to act. Being careful is Shamar, and acting is Oshad. That's verse 29. Let me see what they said. Yep, right, yep, Shamar, Asha. See, be careful is the same word translated as beware and be cautionary and watch, keep, and guard. In Hebrew, we've got all these different English words that's just this one basic Hebrew word, Shema, Shomer, and Asha. Yahweh is saying, you shall not stray to the right or to the left, on the entire way that Yahuwah Eloheka commanded you shall you go, so that, here's the upshot, so that you shall live and it shall be good for you, and you shall prolong your days in the land that you shall possess. So for us to be told by our pastors, professors, priests, prophets, rabbis, teachers, evangelists, apostles, whoever they might be, when we are told, hey, we don't have to do what he said, woohoo, we're free from the law. 
It's a lie. It's satanic. Wayward, veering to the right or the left, which he said not to do. And because Yahuwah built into the system that if we hear, he hears. If we guard his words, he guards our concerns. And when we do what he said, he will do what he said. And when we are told and believe to throw it all away, we have lost and missed out of the whole equation. So when he says, Shema Israel, that's the command. Yahuwah is our Elohim. That's Yahweh Elohim Henu. So on the one hand, he's identifying yod heh vav -Heh as being this guy he was just talking about that just took him out of Egypt and gave him the Ten Commandments. And when he says in the very beginning of the Ten Commandments, Anoke Yahweh Eloheka. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Okay, he's identifying himself. So in the Hebrew mind, that's the first command. Though it's not a command, but it's a matter. The word dabar means matter, not command. Command is chok, or mitzvot, but the matter is deborim, the ten matters, ten concepts. Shema, then, is a, not a command, well, it is a command, but it's also this concept. I'm just trying to give meaning to these. But when he says, I just brought you out of the land of Egypt, well, if you don't identify with this people group, with these obligations that just came out of the land of Egypt, you're not Israel, which means he's not your Elohim, which means those Ten Commandments are not even your concern. And some people said, hey, those Ten Commandments for everybody in the world, honor your mother and father, don't lie, cheat, still kill. It's like, wait a minute, if you're not Israel, you're being invaded by some other entity. We're uh, making a video here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry, you're on camera. That's all you have to say for say yourself? Say hi to people. Gosh, man, the whole world's Wait watching. Wait for the camera, smile. <laughs> Do something good here. <laughs> Sing and dance. Tap. You know how to tap dance? You know how to juggle? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so... To identify Yahweh as our Elohim puts us into a special group who have absorbed upon themselves the obligation to hear, to guard, and then to perform. So this Shema saying, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh your Elohim, that's a huge thing in three words. It's saying, I am that people. I take upon myself the burden and responsibility, the obligation, but also the privilege of being becoming literate of these words to teach children, to have them written on my house, and to have bind them right there between my eyes, to guard them and put my hands only to the task that they tell me to do. And then he says, Yahuwah is the one and only. The Lord is one Lord. Didn't say that. He said, Yahuwah Echad. Now, the same word Echad, there was another verse where it says, one olive tree that we mentioned the other day, that was Zit Echad. Zit, Zion Aleph Tov is olive tree. Echad, one. It's not just about the count. It's also the word unified. So some people say, oh, that's the Trinity, the three in one, the one in three. The Echad also means fit with capacity. It's the Hebrew word then Yod Kaf Lamed is a synonym which means able with ability and capacity and capability to contain it all. In fact, even the word Hayakal, which is translated as being the palace or the temple, means that's the place of all capacity and, and capability to prevail. So to say that something is a Kad is not just hey, here's one tree, but it's a tree that's putting forth fruit or putting forth shade or that's productively doing what it was intended to do. To say that Yahweh is a chad is not just to say he's singular, monotheistic, or unified, a trinity, but it's to say there's only one, one voice, but also that that voice is extremely productive, meaning whatever he said is going to happen. When Yahweh says, you listen to my words and I listen to your voice, bam, it's done. No question. If somebody says, well, God doesn't change. Oh, yes, that's right. He's a God. But he changed the law. He changed the words. He changed the covenant. He changed the rules of the game. Wait a minute. That's not a God. So I have to then, by hearing the Shema, choose to not believe the statement that says, God doesn't change, but he changed the rules. Well, if that's your God, that's up to you. But Yahuwah is the guy who is singular. Now, so if you listen to the four, there's, four, there's another little pondering. Yud, hey, vav, hey, four letters. 
Good. Well, what is that? That's the hand that works, that builds. That's like the, the creator's hand, the, the, like the blue sky, the blue of, we talked about this the other day, the, the blue of the policeman speaks of authority. Well, okay, so I choose to believe that Yod is a reference, the color blue, that the maker and the creator, Elkona, that's Kufnun Hey. Kufnun Aleph means jealous and zealous about his stuff, but Kufnun Hey, like you have written on your house up there in the gable, maker thus possessor of heaven and earth. It's also the word for a bird's nest. But then you have purple, yod hey vav hey, the purple royal decrees, the giver of the Torah, the creator's articulation expressing the words of the Torah. Purple, red, yod hey vav. Well, vav is the number six. It's the masculine suffix, the word for man. So that's like the Messiah. Blue, purple, red. The creator, the hand of the creator, the expression of the Torah, and the Messiah is the Torah incarnate. And then the second hay, just like the first hay, is white. And Yeshua said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to my father's place, but I'm going to give you the comforter, give you the ruach to lead you in the truth. And the truth is the Torah. So this hay has to equal that hay because it's the same letter hay. So anybody who says the New Testament, the new expression of walking in righteousness, does away with the purple first Torah, there's a contradiction. And when you can take all four voices, what he built into creation, what he said in the Torah, everything that Yeshua Mashiach said, and everything that the Ruach leads us to do that are walking in the ways of righteousness, patterned after him, and he said, I'm not doing my own stuff, I'm only doing what I see my father doing, and, what, and, he, and speak what I hear him saying, then it's not four voices, or even a couple voices, you line them all up, echad, and it's a singular voice. All four in direct line. That's just another way to read into contemplating. So when you see that Yahweh is a chad, one voice, there can't be any disagreement in anything any one of his messengers says. Messenger, malak, or message itself, meaning that if it's a prophet, evangelist, a priest, a pastor, a rabbi, it's got to be the same message. And anytime somebody changes the message, according to Yahweh's own words, it's not him. The other interesting thing about this is that if you look at it in Hebrew, when he says Shema, that's Shin Mem Ayin, the Ayin is enlarged. It's one of those jots or tittles. And then when he says Yahweh Echad, the Dalit is enlarged. Well, if you put those two letters together, if you read it Ayin Dalit, that's witness and testimony. Wow. It's also choice best treasure, good to be adorned and ornamented. But if you read it backwards, Dalit Ayin, it means knowledge, to know to be familiar with, to know the adornment of Yahweh is that when he says, listen to me and I will listen to you, and you've got to believe me that every single word I say cannot fail, will never be changed, won't be done away with, but forever teach your children. Put it right there. Write it on your doors. Wear the tzitzit to remind you every single thing I said will happen. Absolute. Can't change. Never fail. Count on it. Bank on it. Be it. Woo! Yeah. Shema Israel. <laughs> Yahu Eloheinu. Yahu Echad. No <laughs> options. And then you think about, okay, let's look at the word Shema real quick. We've just got a few minutes before we end here. Shin Mem Ayin. So let's look at the dictionary. The word Shin Mem Ayin is on, uh, well, if you look at page 666. Uh-oh, that's a bad word there. <gasps> Shin Mem Mem, Shemam, it's not Shin Mem Ayin, we're looking at Shin Mem, this is Shin Mem Mem, just so you see, it means desolated, appalled, horrified, destroyed, ruined, became insane, empty. It's like, remember Dr. Demento way back when, you know, d d to be demented and insane is Shin Mem Mem. Crazy, demented, a crazy train, remember that song we're going to put on talk about uh, another video. But, so I'm just saying, that's, that's one oh, part of Sheen Mem, and if you take the second letter and duplicate it, make it the third, you'll find something about it. There's a certain insanity, but Sheen Mem Ayan then is the healing of that. If you look at Sheen Mem Nun, the other ver word that we talked about, because remember there's association between Mem and Nun, that's one of the things I was getting at, it means to be fat, that's the word for oil, to be greased, lubricated. The number eight, like Shemeni Yatzeret, it means to assess, appraise, evaluate, estimate. That's synonym with the word Eric. And uh, it means fat, stout, robust, thick. 
olive oil. Okay, so if you look at Shin Mem Ayan, page 667, to hear, hearken listening to fulfill somebody's advice. If somebody says, you better put oil in your car, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know of somebody who never, never, as long as they own their car, ever took it and put oil until uh, the engine uh -oh. seized. It's just, you know. But to not fulfill the advice means you didn't listen, you didn't hear. It just means, yeah, yeah, I believed you, but I didn't. You have to hear, believe, take it to heart, and do it. That's the meaning of the word Shema. Understood and obeyed. See, we just think, oh, here, yeah, yeah, it, it hit my eardrums, or, oh, yeah, I think I understood. Proclaim, announce, assemble, hearing or report, fame, hearing, listening, obeying, Shema. And then if we look at Shin Mem Resh, just as a comparative word, 668, to keep, to heed, to watch over, to guard, to observe. So here it's it's kind of hearing and speaking and doing and harboring, obsessing over. Preserve, protect, observe, and celebrate. To celebrate the feast days, to sit here, it is the Sabbath day. Observe it. Don't keep Sabbath. it. Sit down. So not only is this the first day of unleavened bread, it's also the weekly Sabbath today. Observe and celebrate. How do you celebrate unleavened bread? Get the leaven out of your house, eat unleavened bread for seven days. Get together with your friends. That's observing. You can do more than that, but at least do that. Kept guarded, paid regard. To strain or filter, remove the dregs from the wine. Remove the tea leaves from the tea you're drinking. The coffee grounds from the uh, Turkish coffee or Armenian coffee. or the spread. I'm just saying, there's different... Wait, it's also the word for fennel, watch guard. If you look at the word sheen mem ayin, you could read the sheen as a prefix letter, that which is in the condition of or belongs to, similar to the letter bet. Then you look at mem ayin. So if we looked at just mem ayin, page 364, there is no mem ayin. So then you put the hay, mem ayin hay, because the hay is kind of a is the feminine suffix, it means grain, a small weight, a small coin. If you look at mem ayin vav, that's the masculine suffix, uh, there isn't one. So you look at mem ayin vav hey, iniquity, or to pervert. Place of mem ayin vav, yo, let me see. Um, what I'm, I'm just trying to show you part of the part of the process of um, analyzing the words. Mem ayin yod is a heap of stones or ruin. Bowels or intestines. Well, what has that got to do with listening? Sheen mem ayin. Well, if mem ayin he is this small matter, okay, let's look at the two more minutes. Let's look at the meaning or the picture of the letters. Sheen is teeth or fire or that which consumes Mem is, a, is water, or a, like the laver, a bowl of water, to a womb, to be pregnant. Ion is a fruit. It's drawn as a circle with a dot, like a seed with a stem, with a seed in the middle, or a fruit. Or it could be an eyeball with a pupil in the middle. Let's put those together. What do you have? It's like, well, a small thing. So we have this picture that you can put up, if we can, of the girls in the kitchen. Here you have this mixing bowl and this fruit, and they're putting breakfast together, and you realize lavar where we get, is where we get the word laboratory, which is a place where you put things together, which is like being a baby being knit together in a mother's womb. And sheen is fire, so you put something together and you cook it, and what has that got to do with a small thing? What has it got to do with the mem noon in the first picture? Noon jumps out of mem like a baby out of a pregnant person, pregnant, pregnant woman. The baby is born, but why, why do we show the fish jumping back into the mem? What does it mean to Shema is to think about it, take it to heart, and come up with something. And then like the clean animal is the one which regurgitates, chewing the cud. Take it back in, like the, like the noon jumping back into the mem is think about it some more. Chew on it, the sheen. 
heat it up, warm it up, think, talk about it with your friends, write it on your door, ponder the spelling, look at the different ways, come up with something. Hmm, there it is, the, the noon jumping out of the bell. Take it back in again, reprocess it again. And to go through this thing is the act of hey, gimel, hey, haga, which means to ponder, to mutter, <coughs> excuse me, to contemplate, to spell words phonetically, letter by letter, discuss them with your friends, teach them to your children, and keep readdressing and readdressing. The word lamed, lamed, talmud, means teach, learn, rehearse. Take it to heart. Think about that. Chew on that. Ponder it. And to keep going over videos, which is one reason why we're doing these videos, look at them a few times, get more stuff out of it. That's what it means to Shema. Like the picture, the fish jumping from this pool, that pool, back into that pool, putting together a fruit salad, like we did that video on Mountain Air 7 a couple years ago with Paul Barry. Cat with Paul. Paul? <laughs> Shalom, Paul. Hey, Paul. Barry. Sitting right at the other end of the house. <laughs> you just love saying his name. <laughs> he taught me a hundred times. I love that guy. Besides the man himself, his name is a thing of beauty. Paul Barry. <laughs> that was a good video, Eric. Shema for sure, brother. Thank you so Shalom much. Shalom Alechem and Pesach Sameach. Hallelujah.